All right, go. All right. So, my time is right now. Okay. Hello, my name is Michael Hartle. Uh, you may know me as the author of the Ruby on Rails tutorial. Uh, I'm, I have two things to, yes, thank you. I have two things to mention. Uh, so one of the things I'm working on right now is a series of prerequisite tutorials uh, under the brand Learn Enough to be Dangerous, starting with Learn Enough Command Line to be Dangerous. So the first thing I need is newbies. If you're a newbie or if you know newbies, I am looking for newbies to help me work on this series of for pre prerequisites leading all the way up to the Ruby on Rails tutorial. The second thing is that if you are an expert on any technical subject, I'm looking for people to work with under the Learn Enough to be Dangerous brand. Learn Enough Vim to be Dangerous, I've got someone working on. Learn Enough iOS to be Dangerous. So if you have an idea for that, please get in touch with me. Uh, I'm also interested in maybe writing a full Ruby tutorial at some point, but that's a huge project I'm looking for someone to collaborate with. So if any of this piques your interest, reach out to me. I'm available at michael at michaelhartle.com. Thank you. And breathe. Uh, any other takers? One minute talks. Usually we get one or two. All right, come on up. You're on the list, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I should allow anybody. <laughs> Who's got the fucking mic now? No, um. And uh, what's your name, sir? I'm David Bach. Uh, David, David Bach. Broke. Yep. I'll also speak tomorrow, so. Okay, this was originally a seven-minute Toastmasters talk, so I'm going to try to do it in a minute. In 1922, a woman in Waltham, Massachusetts, who ran a restaurant, was making butter drop dew cookies. She ran out of cocoa, so she chopped up a chocolate bar, put it in thinking it would melt. It didn't. She accidentally invented the Toll House chocolate chip cookie recipe. She ran the Toll House restaurant. In 1938, Andrew Nestle showed up, said, hey, she was popular for the cookie among other baked things, said, I would like to buy that recipe from you and the name, and he paid $10,000 and a lifetime supply of chocolate. And then he put it on the bag of chocolate chips for free, and every chocolate chip manufacturer copied it. Why would he do that? This is the original open source idea. He open sourced the chocolate chip cookie recipe, because he was selling chocolate, not selling the recipe. If he sold more chips, if he sold more chips for everybody, it raised his bottom line. So the idea here is you can use that story to convince your management to open source stuff that is not critical to your business infrastructure. Open source stuff that, you know, give back to the community. We all rely on it. Thank you. Very good job. Excellent. Superb, in fact. Uh, I'm even going to pronounce your name correctly. David, good job. <laughs> Such high praise. Um, any other ones? Yes. Come on up. All right, hello. Um, you can stand the whole time and clap if you want. It's pretty, pretty, yeah, I know. I'm here all night. Um, my name is Benjamin Fleischer. I am a Rubyist. That's because I get paid to do Ruby. That's how I think of myself. I wanted to share two interesting things with you. They're interesting by my own uh, opinions. Here's what they are. One of them is uh, Ruby, if you've ever had an issue with string encoding, particularly if you live from the dark days of 1.8 to 1.9, things blow up. So I did some work on the RSpec library to make this easier and basically not blow up. If you're interested in, if you ever have problems with strings, gem install encoded string, problem solved, use that. It's, uh, gonna, it's gonna evolve along with RSpec. Other thing, if you uh, ever wanted to see a one commit, one line commit to Rails of one character deletion, uh, that's a commit that I made. And I have another example of uh, other commits that are very small that you can make to things like Rails whatever. If you go to my speaker deck, uh, slash BF4, that's my GitHub, you can see that. And that's, I think, all the time I have. And that's why I went now, because I'm really far down the list. <laughs> Happy Monday. Thank you, Benji. So without further ado, uh, if I didn't say this before, I will be mispronouncing everyone's name. Uh, that is in fairness to people whose names I cannot pronounce. So the first one is uh, Stevie Down Down D. 
Yeah, let's just go with that. Go, go ahead. My first sentence says, my name is Steve. How do we pronounce it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's OK. My pseudonym is Captain Downer, so just call me Captain Downer. All right, Cap. OK. Floor is yours. This is my ninth RubyConf, and they seem to get bigger and better every year. Thanks to the great folks that run it. Big kudos. I've written a web app called Tommy Talker that will help, that need, with help from the open source community, can be a complete universal translator. It's, it's going to and currently supports 26 languages. Um, all the phrases appear as links in your chosen language, and when you click on the phrase, which is a link, it speaks it in, currently only in English. Um, I haven't a clue what will happen if you all try and log on to the app at once right now because it hasn't been stress tested and it's on a single server. Uh, it's a dedicated server, but even so, you might want to try this after the show. Um, but you can try it now. If it works, it works, and if the server blows up, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I can always reboot it. Uh, when you access the site, the default language is English. There's a scrollable drop-down menu for selecting languages, and I explain what happens. Once you select a language, it immediately translates the text into your chosen language. I originally wrote this as a touch-and-speak application for my brother, who unfortunately has a chronic disease that is slowly causing him to lose his ability to speak. All of his smarts are still going to be there, but he's not going to be able to move his mouth. So I tried to come up with something that he could use to communicate that didn't involve typing because he's not a computer guy. It's just simply touch and it speaks. So it's very easy. Um, I have to uh, give, give thanks to Robert Clem, who a lot of you know from the Ruby Talk group because he corrected the Google translated German strings for me to be correct German. And I also had a guy called Simon Courtois, who's in the Paris RB user group, who I just contacted via email. I contacted the group, and they had a guy that was willing to do it that was fluent in both English and, and French. So right now, I've got two balls on right phrases, but I still have to have recordings of those phrases in French and in German and in 24, uh, 23 other languages. So I'm looking for volunteers that speak a foreign language, they don't have to be bilingual, but it will certainly help. Um, and the design is eventually going to evolve where you can pick a source and a target language. Once I have all 26 languages recorded, you'll be able to present the phrases in English, and the output can be in Spanish or Estonian or Russian or Japanese. Um, and it's just a simple, this is kind of a niche market, because Google already does this. And I, got, I basically use Google Translate to do all of the phrases. Um, but I was always, I was always, uh, I was a Star Trek fan. I was a Trekkie. And the Universal Translator has always been one of those just not quite there yet goals. But we're, we're so close to it now, and Google does such a good job of it that uh, they're fine. But with Google, you still have to type stuff in, or you have to speak stuff in. If you lose your ability to speak, you can't speak and have it translate and speak in another language. So this is sort of on a different, different, means. It's really more, like I said, it originally started out for people that couldn't, couldn't actually move their mouth and speak. So instead, they point at what they want to say, and the computer or the phone or the tablet says it. Um, the project is open sourced on GitHub, and the exception is, is the MP3 data is redacted uh, for GitHub size, re size. I have thousands of MP3 files that just got useless as, as it's being stored up on Google because it just didn't, didn't work well. So I've got all the MP3 files at home that I'm willing to share with anyone that happens to contact me so they can actually have a working copy of the file if they download the source code. But the source code's there. It has every line of code in the file, and everything that it does is kept up to date. Um, if, you, if you know someone who speaks a foreign language that would like to contribute to open source, they don't have to be a computer programmer. They have to be able to have access to a microphone and some computer or some recording device that will record the files, preferably in MP3 format. It'll just save me some extra, extra work uh, doing file conversions. 
Um, and if you do know someone that contribute uh, my email, oh, you didn't tell me my screen ran off. My email, my email account is Captain Downer at Gmail. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, and have Cap. a great RubyConf. Hello, RubyConf San Antonio. Everybody hear me okay? Excellent. It's good to be back again. So uh, we're a large uh, JRuby shop, running a big production system, and this is the latest open source gem that we have available. So give it a try, have a look, see what it looks like. So rock a job. So we're going to jump straight into some code. We don't have much time. So we're going to create a simple job called my job. Uh, it inherits from a rocket job job. And simple method perform, and it's just going to do something. Uh, now the key thing to look at here is when you want to create that job, it's simply my job dot create bang. It's none of the complex APIs that we have to do with the other systems. This is very simple, like you do with the ORM active record type models. So that's it. You create your first job, and now you've run it. So let's add some attributes to this job. The traditional way is you can add some random hash or some other parameters that end the perform, but in this scenario, what we can do is actually define a key. So if we have a look at this line, we can define an attribute within the model. So now I'm going to add a file name and define it of type string. And again, so if I want to kick it off, all I do is I say my job.create and I say file name data.csv. Validations. So now that we can be able to create this job, we're giving it a file name. We want to run all our regular validations against it. What's the point of kicking off a job if we cannot validate that all the parameters are done and correct before we even kick that job off? We want the end user was actually creating the job to, to see the failure. Nor do I have to dig through some logs or backend system to find it. So there you can see, any of your validations. I'm sure you're familiar with all the regular validations that you can do, they're all there. And again, I just say my job.create, and then you'll see at the bottom it doesn't work. Immediately it comes up with the file name can't be blank. So immediately my job has been validated. Job status. So how many of you kicked off a job, goes into the back end system, and okay, what's happened to it? How do I find out what's happening to it programmatically? Very often the different APIs is difficult to use. You've all used active record, active models. All you do is, after you've created your job, go and ask it for its state. So before we create the model, job.state, okay, it's queued. Now I do a job.reload.status. That reloads it from the data store, and I have the current status of that job immediately available to me. Um, you can see in this state it's running, and eventually it'll go to completed. So I can ask the job, have you completed running yet? And it'll come back as true. And then another key element, how about getting back the result of that job? I sent some work off to go do something. But I want to know what that result was. I don't want to store it in some database or somewhere else and have to try and figure out where it is. Give it back to me. And this will do that for you. So states, you can see a queued running, completed, and the output. So now we've been able to do a simple job. We've given it a file name, it ran off, and a single worker somewhere is going to pick up that file and process it. But what if I want to take a million line file now, it's CSV data, and I want to use you know, 500, 1,000 servers, all workers out there that we want to process that data? That's going to be a lot of work in a lot of systems. In this scenario now, we've created a CSV job, and we just derive it from a slice job. So the difference here is we can set some defaults up. So the first thing I'm going to say is collect output, because I want to keep the output of that CSV data. Then the other thing is, now is the perform. When the perform occurs, it's going to get that line. So remember, we had a million line CSV file. Each job now, is going to, each of these workers is going to get that single line out of those million lines, one at a time. This is real easy. I can pause that line. And in this scenario for this test, we are just going to reverse it. So we take the row, reverse it, send it back as a CSV data. The CSV processing is all done within the workers themselves. I'm not doing that as my loader process or anything like that. It's all spread out. So this is how you define the job itself. Now we have a simple job that will run across hundreds of servers or wherever you want it to be, and it'll do it concurrently at the same time in all those boxes. So how do we kick that off? So we want to do the upload job. We've got a CSV job. Or we just say job.upload, give it the file name. It breaks it up, sends it all out. When the job's finished, I just download it. It's that easy. So some more features, uh, some of the enterprise features in the Rockstar Pro. Encryption. I'm uploading sensitive data. The CSV data might, con might contain social security numbers, bank account numbers. I need to be able to encrypt that. Immediately it's available to you. We have a UI, web UI, all open source. You can try this out. You can see the status of every single job in the system. 
Uh, and it summarize that you can run a standalone. You don't have to run Rails. You can run with Rails. You've got the web UI. And the another critical aspect is it has business-based priority processing along with their enterprise features. And this is in production today and has been in there for over a year. So you can, tr you can trust it. That's it from our side. And join us on the Gitter chat session if you have any questions. Gitter IM, Rocket Job Support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hello. I'm uh, no one of consequence. I have about 50 slides, so we're gonna get right into it. Ideas are everywhere. And when we encounter a new idea, we respond in different ways depending on how it fits in with our existing knowledge. Now you can tell this is a thought leader talk because I have clouds on my slides. Some ideas are those that we've seen before and already adopted, and we just carry on. Some ideas fill gaps in our existing knowledge, and we easily adopt those. Other ideas are just kind of on the fringe of what we already know. We'll think about those a little bit more, but we'll probably adopt them fairly quickly. Then there's those ideas that are way out there. Some ideas are so wild that it is absolutely, totally, and in all other ways, inconceivable that they could ever work. We almost always reject those ideas out of hand. Why do we do that? The main reason is optimization. Only help. Um, we have to be bilingual. Only so many things we can learn. We're swamped. We run ideas through a filter, and the inconceivable ideas. The other languages. Seth Godin says it very well in a blog post. You're probably smart enough to get it merely by reading the 140 character summary of just about anything. But of course, that doesn't mean you understand it or that it changed you. All it means is that you are quickly able to sort it into an appropriate category to make a decision about where it belongs in your mental filing cabinet. Another reason we might reject these inconceivable ideas is because they wouldn't work in the real world. Jason Fried and DHH wrote in Rework, the real world isn't a place, it's an excuse. It's a justification for not trying, it has nothing to do with you. So maybe this word doesn't mean what we think it means. What happens if we adopt these ideas? Ideas change us, and the inconceivable ideas have the potential to change us so significantly that the world becomes a completely different place. The same blog post by Seth Godin, he goes on to say, the best experiences and the biggest ideas don't fit into a category. They change it. They don't get filed away, they transform us. We need to spend more time on these ideas. I'm going to give you a few examples of some inconceivable ideas um, that used to be inconceivable. They're now widely accepted, just so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. First one is dynamically typed languages. We're all Rubyists, we get this one. But it used to be that you need a compiler and a static type checking to keep you safe, right? Incremental and iterative development or agile development. You can't just start writing software and evolving it over time. You need a plan, an architecture, and a design first or test-driven development. Developers can't test their own code. You need a separate group of testers that don't work closely with the developers. We have to try inconceivable ideas sometime. But how? I've now given you even more guilt about things you should be doing. I might have led you into a pit of despair. You might think you'll never survive. How do we really get started? Well, first of all, we need to suppress our initial reaction of rejecting these ideas. Instead of saying, that will never work, we need to start asking, what would have to be true to make that work? That question is often enough to get our creativity going. Another thing we can try is we can try car cargo culting. We can accept what other people are saying about these ideas and trust them long enough to give it a fair shot and see what happens, see if we get it. We need to clear our mental cache. This is a blog post by Ben Orenstein, and he talks about these ideas that are recorded in his brain from so long ago that are just no longer true, and we need to be able to clear those out. We still have time constraints, we still have work to get done, even if we're managing energy like Joe talked about today. So maybe what we can do is we can pick one inconceivable idea and try it. Um, so I'm gonna give you a list of ideas, and what I'd really like for you to do is pick one of them to try, and if you don't, I shall be very put out. <laughs> And I'd like you to tweet your intention to try the idea with the hashtag inconceivable, and I'll watch that for a while and just kind of see what comes out. So here's 10 ideas. Pick one that you haven't tried before that seems crazy and give it a fair shot and see what happens. So try working with a fast test suite. This might need to be a side project. <laughs> Make a budget and live on it. Try mind mapping. Use a much larger font size in your editor. Use a proportionally spaced font. I got that one from David Brady, so blame him if it doesn't work for you. 
Uh, be a giver. Try journaling. Try pair programming or mob programming if you haven't before. Try getting completely out of debt. That one might take a while. <laughs> or try, some, try using automated refactoring tools. In a longer version of the talk, I would go through why I would like you to try those, but for now, you're just going to have to maybe take it on faith. Um, give it a shot. You'll be surprised what happens. Uh, again, tweet it with the hashtag inconceivable. I went through that list really fast. It's up on my blog. There's the link. And after you've tried the idea and you know what happens, let me know. And remember, this is for posterity, so be honest. <laughs> Have fun storming the castle. I'm up there. Very good. This is uh, software engineering lessons from aviation, or as I like to call it, plane programming. Ah, you see what I did there? My name is Billy Watson. I am the lead engineer at JD Power Odo. I'm a pilot, sort of, uh, internet scale data. I'm a student pilot. And Ruby at the same shop in sunny Orlando, Florida. Sunny when it's not thunderstorms. Definitions, uh, just so we agree on some terminology and you understand what the hell I'm talking about. General aviation is pilots like me. I'm not in a commercial airline. I do not have a backup. I am my own backup. And the only chance I have to survive is me, me, and me. Uh, a go around is when a pilot is trying to land a plane and he decides that ain't happening this time, firewalls a throttle and does a circle around the airport and tries again. The FAA, if you're not from this country, think government and slow. Uh, SOP, standard operating procedure, we'll get into more of that. Uh, flow check is how I check my instruments, it's something I have in my memory. And a checklist is how I become a second pilot, it's something I have written down that I hold up in my field of vision and that is my second pilot, just to make sure I don't screw up. Quick shout out to Michael Martins, who did a talk yesterday called Mind Over Error. He mentioned some of this in his Q&A section. And another shout out to Nicholas Means, who did a talk about nothing but aviation uh, and how we got some lessons from programming. So these are some other lessons. Quick, quick disclaimer. Uh, these are the kind of issues we deal with. What kind of idiot wrote this program? Oh, it was me two months ago. Uh, these are the issues I deal with as a pilot. I thought we'd never break out of those clouds, let alone upside down towards those rabbits. So um, <laughs> not so happy anymore. Okay, so in aviation, an immediate go around on call out. Uh, there's a document that lists this uh, procedure from the FAA in, as of 2007. Basically, anyone in the cockpit, not just the captain, can call for a go around, and whoever is at the controls must immediately firewall the throttle and go around. Period, end of story. Doesn't matter what you think, you go around. Do not die. Uh, enable everyone to fix problems is the lesson. This comes before problems occur or after problems occur. So I've got some ways you can do this. Um, group code review, open code review, runtime docs, and method documentation are some ways you can have this done at your place. Uh, the word takeoff means cleared for takeoff. This is from the awful Tenerife disaster where 587 people died. Um, they never say, do not take off, or, or I wish I could take off my shirt. Uh, they say, take off when you are cleared for takeoff, end of story, in case there's some radio communication errors. Uh, careful about your verbiage. Uh, agree on some verbiage with your business users. Use that same verbiage in your code, and uh, don't use the word match five different ways, as we do at, at our place. Uh, <laughs> uh, be careful about what you say, so that way you can train new developers and you can understand your code tomorrow. Uh, the safest general aviation pilots, me, uh, use flow checks and checklists. You back yourself up. So when you're fixing problems at 10.30 at night by yourself, code review yourself. Submit a pull request to yourself. Go get a glass of water, uh, urinate, do whatever, walk the dog, come back, and reread your code before you push. Um, if, you are, if you're saying that doesn't apply to me, we always do that sort of thing. Uh, fine, you're better than me. OK, pilots have routine instrument scans. I'm not just talking about my flow checks. I'm talking about if I'm in the clouds, I will look at the instruments, and I will hum a tune that's 120 beats per minute, like staying alive, and I will look at those instruments. And I do it the same way every time for safety. In, uh, in our world, what we can do is say that the completion criteria for a story includes metrics, logs, documentation, and testing, period, or it does not get merged down. Uh, you have to have agreement 
with your business, obligatory cuteness, that's my Shih Tzu, and that's someone else's Shih Tzu dressed as a pilot. Okay, great. Uh, big picture. That's a big plane with six engines. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, standard operating procedures reduce errors. Standard operating procedures include those things I mentioned before, uh, but maybe some other things, like use refactoring methods. Uh, refactoring the patterns is a great book, or you can cheat and just look up the million posts about it online. But if every time you needed to move a method from a subclass to a superclass, you did it the same way, you would be so much faster and so much better at your job. It's boring, but it's better, I assure you. Uh, it's way less boring and exciting, or way more boring and way less exciting than having to deal with bugs for 45 minutes because you didn't run your tests. Uh, code review yourself, as I said, agonize over names and turns, and completeness doesn't mean done. Uh, in traditional terms, no, 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 it means documented, uh, monitored, and tested. Uh, my name is Billy Watson. You can find me on Twitter, confusingly, at, at William R. Watson, and you can find me down there uh, for questions about aviation, Dallas Cowboys, or uh, programming. Thanks. Good afternoon, Rubicon. Good afternoon. Got some news for you. You already know about this. Moore's Law is running out, and you're all familiar with Moore's Law. Here's a graphical representation of it. Moore's Law is the observation that we can double the number of transistors on a wafer of silicon every 18 months or so. And this is, the, this is Moore's Law graphically. Here's Moore's Law visually. Because every time we double the number of transistors on a wafer of silicon, we increase processing power. Therefore, all of the functions in the devices in the top photograph are in the single device in the bottom photograph. That's Moore's Law. But Moore's Law is running out, the party is almost over, and we're going to have to do something else to extract processing power from our computers. Enter parallelism. And one way we can learn about parallelism is through a tiny device called Parallela. It's a single board computer, roughly the size of a credit card or a Raspberry Pi, and you plug in your HDMI monitor, plug in your USB keyboard, and you're good to go. It's got 18 cores, and you can fit this thing in your hand. It's got two ARM cores, 16 RISC cores, and I'll define those in a second. Uh, RISC is the 80-20 rule applied to computing. It's reduced instruction set computing. The 80-20 rule, computer engineers have observed that 20% of our instructions are executed 80% of the time. So we've taken steps to make those instructions execute very quickly, very performantly. And then we build the remaining instructions out of those building blocks. So that's risk. So let's take a look at Parallela in action. This is what it looks like. It is a Linux, Linux computer. It runs a distribution of Linux called Linero. It's a variation of Ubuntu. It's got a web browser. It's got a command line interface. And it has the best text editor ever known to humans. Let's say it all together, Vim. <laughs> It's low power, too. I wanted to convince myself that it was really low power, so I took one of these handheld cellular charging devices with a photovoltaic cell on one side and a lithium-ion battery inside of it, jerry-rigged a USB cable and uh, a power adapter, soldered those puppies together, and yes, you can power it via solar power with a little five-watt solar device there, right? Let's talk about architecture. Inside the 16 cores, there's four rows, four columns. Rows are numbered 0 through 3, columns numbered 0 through 3. Let's take a look at what it can do for you. First, we're going to look for the, all of the prime numbers between 0 and 16 million in serial on the parallela. If you execute that, it takes just under four minutes. That's what the screen looks like. If you do the same program, run the same program on Mac OS X, in fact, this same uh, Mac that I'm uh, working with right here, Serial on Mac OS X, it takes roughly 14.4 seconds. So four minutes, 14.4 seconds. What if you run that same program, you modify it so it can run in parallel on the Parallela? Well, let's take a look at it. And I have a real quick movie for you running here. Let's take a look. We'll watch it build and run. And if you take a look inside of the parentheses, you see an ordered pair, row, column. What happened? All right, it's a lightning talk, so I'm going to skip ahead. Here's the punchline. In the parentheses, you see row, column for each core. It took 18.6 seconds. Let's summarize those results. 
Serial on the parallel, about four minutes. Serial on the Mac, about 14 seconds. Parallel on the parallel, about 18 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, this $150 handheld computer is performing about in the class of a $2,000 Mac. But don't throw away your Macs because, <laughs> don't throw away your Macs because we kind of, this is kind of a setup. This is an example of an embarrassingly parallel problem, problem or an embarrassingly parallel program. What's going on here is this is the type of problem that we can break up into bite sized pieces very readily and it can be executed very quickly in parallel. If you want more details on this, you can go to my blog at rayhightower.com. We're at the end of the talk. Bottom line, this is Parallela. You can buy it for about 150 bucks at amazon.com. We as developers need to learn about parallelism now because Moore's Law, the party is almost over. And it's time for us to learn about parallelism so we can continue to extract performance out of our silicon. My name is Ray Hightower. You can learn more about me at rayhightower.com. Thank you for listening. I recently sat down to write my first Ruby gem, and I thought, I thought, let's make something useful, at least to me and hopefully to some of you. And so I decided I was going to do something with struct and make it how I like it. So data objects, great in theory. You could turn data into an object when you got nice dot methods, uh, use it in factories. And you get a nice no method error when you uh, do something wrong, like call van.pant instead of paint, instead of getting a nil on your hash. Uh, they're great-ish in Ruby, though. Um, you can call your struct without your arguments, and you get nils. I don't like nils in my structs. And this isn't cool either. You, can't, you don't get Ruby's cool keyword arguments that are so awesome. And also, you can change them. Van.year, 1965, I don't want an accessor on my struct. It's a data object. I don't want it to change. So van.year equals 2015, not cool. And then, like I said, keyword arguments. We've had them for a while. Why aren't they in struct? So I decided I was going to put them in struct. So that's where we get uh, op no, open struct. Doesn't help either. It actually makes it worse, because now we can have Van.pain equals red, and van.crazypants equals true out of nowhere, and even better, van.highmom, and if you don't give it anything, it just sets it to nil, which is awful. A few of the gems out there, I'm not the first person to think of how cool it would be to make data objects in Ruby immutable. Some of them do it. They're great, less than 100 lines of code. You should use them. You should check mine out. Use theirs because they're older and more maintained, and it's not somebody's first gem. But I would love if you would try mine as well. So what does er do? Well, first it has required keyword arguments. So car equals er dot new, paint year. If you try to call it without paint and year, it tells you you're missing keyword paint. Uh, so we have one where it works. Scooby van equals car year 1965, paint mural. Scooby van year 1965. That's how, it sh that's how I like it to work. Um, then we have uh, it's effectively immutable. If you try to change it, it does not have an assignment method. And then the newest release, last night I updated it while I was here at RubyConf to have a 2JSON method, so it'll spit you out some JSON. And er, please use it, please love it, please contribute to it because it is my first gem and I would like people to make it better. Thank you. Divine. The floor is yours. Thank you. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, cool. So my name is Devin Clark, and uh, this is my talk called 3D Printing is Not Like Cooking Rotisserie Chicken at Home. And it's about to make sense. Don't worry. It will make sense. Uh, so a while ago, about a year ago, I got a 3D printer. Uh, I built it, and on coming to RubyConf, I built uh, or printed a giant Ruby and everything so I can use it as a talking point and use it to uh, like start conversations. And a lot of people have come up to me and asked me questions about 3D printing, and everyone's been really awesome and cool. And uh, I always get that question every once in a while, like, oh, man, can you print me one? I want one of those. It's like, how much does it cost? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't really print you one. And then they, they saunter off, and they look all sad and defeated, and I'm wondering, man, I wonder if they're going to be like, well, pff, fine. I'm just going to go and make my own 3D printer, Devin, and I'm going to print 
all the rubies, more rubies than you can imagine. And I'll print cool stuff like tiny Bulbasaurs or this little drawer and everything, and it'll be amazing. And I'll show my friends, and this will be the face that they make. <laughs> Unless they have a 3D printer. Then they'll be like, okay, whatever. But as you get into 3D printing, you start to notice a lot of things, like for instance, it's really slow. Like really, really, really slow. So slow that I can't even show you this whole video. Not enough time. It's also kind of temperamental. So your parts will break. Uh, and then what's great is those parts are three printable, so your broken 3D printer can't print them. Uh, and then also at the same time, you'll have something not stick to the bed, it'll fail halfway through, it'll fail, a seven hour print will fail with 12 minutes left, and it's too bad, so sad. You can also hurt yourself. That's not guaranteed, but it hurts a lot. Uh, and, but then you're gonna be like, well Devin, no, no, it's totally worth it. Look, I can print this awesome, cool dragon. Look how awesome that dragon is until you realize you have to break it up into six different pieces and then assemble it with glue. And if you want it to look anywhere as cool as that, you gotta print it and hope that your print quality came out as nice. Um, or you're like, no, Devin, I can print it with, with supports. But then you waste all that extra plastic and then you gotta break all those hard plastic supports off and then sand down all those pieces because otherwise you're gonna have all these little bumps and bruises all over your print. And the entire time you print that, who knows, 10, 20 hour print, you're hoping it doesn't come out like that. So now you're probably thinking like, wait, 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 what's going on, Devin? You came up here saying, 3D printing is awesome, it's the future, it's so cool, people will be jelly of me. And now you're feeling a little betrayed because I'm being really negative and you're like, oh, I don't understand what's going on. And it's not because I want to stand up here like this. That's not how I want to stand up here like that. It's actually because I, I want all of you guys to get into 3D printing, but I want you to get into it with the correct expectations because 3D printing is not like cooking rotisserie chicken at home. It is not a set it and forget it process. It is not something you just, oh, I buy a 3D printer, I get something offline, I pop it in and come back a few hours later, it's the most perfect print in the world. No, it's not like that. It's tedious, it's uh, some hard work involved. You go through multiple prints over and over again and it's very frustrating. But when you get something like this, this is how you feel to the T, <laughs> and you run out and you show your friends and they're like, oh my God, that is the coolest thing ever and you get to act like this. And because, you know, they didn't see the 14 failed prints at home. So a lot of you are gonna be like, well, how can I get involved with 3D printing? There's a free way to get involved with 3D printing and you can usually go online to, uh, to, uh, to meetups and there's usually a one, usually one in almost every city and they have little labs and you can get a tutorial or learn how to use a 3D printer or they'll have a workshop that you can pay for and everything. Um, so you don't have to spend a bunch of money and everything like that. But I highly recommend doing as much research as you can because when you go out there and you look at the printers, you're like, oh man, that $400 printer, oh, that's in my budget, that sounds nice. But it's not the same as that one that costs more than $2,000 and everything. Uh, you can get, still get awesome print quality with a cheaper printer, but you want to make sure that you build within your budget. The last thing I want you guys to do is go out, buy a cheap printer, and then have your prints not come out great, and then go online and be like, 3D printing sucks, it's not the future. We want everyone to be excited and, you know, help keep building it out open sourcely like we are and everything, and make awesome prints. Because the limit, there's, well, I guess there's really no limitations and everything like that, because there's really nothing you can't print. And I'm, I'm really, really serious. <laughs> There's really nothing you can't print. Uh, so just a quick shout out to the guys who uh, made my printer and everything like that and helped me build it. Uh, monolith, it's a Monolith 3D open source printer. And uh, it's built by these guys over at FreeFab 3D in St. Petersburg, Florida. They're all really awesome. And uh, I wouldn't be up here with an awesome Ruby if it wasn't for them and everything like that. But uh, my, my, again, my name is Devin Clark and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your conference and everything like that. Thanks for your time. I'm on it. So uh, I kind of feel like maybe I should have seen that last talk uh, before I, I did this. Um, so this is the place that I constantly find myself, is I, I say something to a friend or whatever, and then I commit, right? Like I gotta get it done. So in over my head. So a little bit about 3D printing for those of you who don't know. If you take a really precise machine, like a machine that can position itself well, and you give it a hot glue gun, you have essentially what my 3D printer is, right? <laughs> super simple, super simple. So simple that PrinterBot actually named their printer Simple, right? So I looked at this and I thought, 
to myself, I can totally do that. This has a build uh, size of a four inch cube, right? So like that's the largest thing that you can build is that. And I thought, I can take that and I could build my own. I just need to buy this kit and maybe modify it slightly. Um, really what I built was a monstrosity. Um, I significantly improved the build size, but it was um, not designed as well as it could be. It actually would fall over under its own weight, so I had to strap it to that table. It's awesome. Um, I found this guy who, who actually can design things much better than I can, and he designed this beautiful printer. It had a one foot uh, build space, which is amazing, right? But that's not nearly large enough for my needs. So I took his um, open design and tried to make it better, as I am wont to do. I printed out the parts on my little tiny printer. Um, I assembled it, and really to give you a size, like, like a concept of how large this printer is, it's a three foot uh, build size, which my daughter at this point was uh, roughly three feet. So to give you an idea, she believes in me a lot, right? You can tell that in her eyes. What are you building? A giant 3D printer. A, a giant 3D printer. Um, so these are the parts that I assembled, right? These are all the things that he designed that are beautiful and wonderful. Um, we get to the z-axis, and it had, I had to change significantly how this works, right? Because the way that he had it designed, it was fine for a small space. But whenever you start getting to the size of bed that I have, um, it, it doesn't work anymore. So this is the point. I, I'm not a, like, I am a hobbyist. Um, I don't know electronics. And so whenever this actually moved, it was the best day of my life. Uh, <laughs> Defeated only by getting married and having children, seeing lights flickering <laughs> and motors spinning. Amazing. So as of just uh, about a month ago, this is what the printer looked like, right? It's um, wood and metal and wires and, and it barely, it, it actually works. It's amazing. So why? Why in the world would you need this large of a printer? Well, I'll tell you why. I have children. And my family loves to dress up. We love to dress up into, as all kinds of different characters. And um, my two girls fight me constantly. And whenever you have that problem, um, you need a suit of armor. <laughs> this guy built this incredible suit. I was super jealous. And I totally said to my friend, I can do that too. Not anywhere close, right? So you need a giant printer so that you can scan yourself with the Kinect maybe and, uh, and then print out parts. Thanks. Hi, I'm Paul Dawson. Um, <laughs> I wanted to take- uh, He gets extra points for going with it. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, speak real shortly about how we approach problems and how some of the tools we use when we approach those problems totally affect like some of the solutions that we come up with and the different problem spaces that we end up in. And I wanted to begin with kind of a struggle that I had when I first started development, uh, especially specifically test-driven development. A lot of times I'd find myself staring at a screen a lot like this, wondering exactly what my first test should be, right? Like a lot of times everybody says test first and do this thing and you get kind of stuck and you're not really sure what to do. And as we grow as developers, we kind of build, we kind of gather this like group knowledge, right? Like of where the right part to break out an abstraction is and where the right test to start out is. Instead of, you know, when you're new, the thing you end up thinking about is like, I just want it to work. Right? Like, I, I want the whole thing to just, and I love this image. Um, I've seen it in a few talks. Like, the, the whole idea of, you know, you just want the whole thing to happen. Right? And I actually bring this up. I have an ulterior motive. I don't know how many of you have taken any art classes or done any drawing. A um, few of you. So I'm a terrible artist, but I, I did try and take some art classes at one point in my life. And one of the things they talk about uh, whenever you're taking an art class and learning how to draw, one of the things they do is they actually make you flip the image upside down, right? Because there's this thing in your head whenever you're trying to draw something that you think you know what it looks like, like maybe a human face, that makes it very difficult for you to separate the lines of what makes up the face and the color gradients from what your brain thinks they should look like. And so a lot of times to break that apart, what you do is you flip it upside down and it makes it a little easier to separate that in your head. 
Now, obviously, the solution here is we should just flip all of our test suites upside down, right? Throw all of the code, flip it up. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Um, but one thing that I found especially helpful in my case is maybe not trying to think about the entire problem at once, right? And a good place to start, maybe, is where you interact with this thing. Um, I've been playing a lot with a functional reactive front end. I know don't throw stuff at me. I'm at a Ruby conference called Elm. And um, it gives you the ability, the way it works, you kind of build this model of your UI state. And the way this model changes is by passing messages into it and updating the state, right? And whenever you build this thing starting at the very front end, what it does is it sort of outlines what sort of application or what sort of like uh, API endpoints you want on the back end to communicate directly with it. And what's interesting about that, like you can build it out in Sinatra or you know, whatever you want to build it out with, and what's interesting about that is a lot of times when you're starting at the API level or you're starting at a very like higher level and working your way down, the types of things and the types of gems that you use to build it with are very, very different. Like I found myself trying to build things without using an ORM at all or like trying to roll something that just uses the small subset of SQL that I actually need to solve the problem. Um, and so I guess really the point I wanted to get across is be careful of the tools that we're using and try, especially when you're teaching and whenever you're trying to express things to people, like to uh, think more about the messages that you're pushing around um, and like how your things are communicating. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and how, how things are communicating and less about trying to fit all of the functionality of the problem that you're, solve, of the problem that you're solving um, within your head. Because, I don't know, I have a really tiny brain and I'm not very good at that. Anyways, thanks. Uh, that's it. Hi, I'm Mickey Rezenis. I work with Spreedly in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I came up with this talk because um, I spent 20 years basically teaching math uh, privately and also in a high school. And I also coached, I've coached about 10 years of high school sports. And so I transitioned into software engineering about three years ago. And in the transition, I got to go from the top of the totem pole where I was telling everyone else what to do to the bottom of the totem pole, which was interesting because as a teacher, you start seeing onboarding as um, a little differently at, than you do as a software engineer. And so uh, came to the conference. This is my first Ruby Conf, by the way, and it's great fun. I did not know I was going to do a lightning talk, and so all of this was done last night. I know it's awesome, but don't be jealous. All right, so here are my tips for onboarding jun junior devs. First, as a teacher, we had a book that I read. It was uh, written by uh, John Milton in uh, the late 1800s. It's called The Seven Laws of Teaching. And not all of them are applicable to our industry, but many of them are. I'm going to go over three of them. First, the teacher has to know the lesson. This seems obvious, but I'm pretty sure we've all sat in classes where the teacher does not know what they're talking about. Um, I'm pretty confident that most of the time, by the time you reach senior dev, m most of the senior devs I've worked with have, have, know what they're talking about. Um, but you also have to have a lesson. So when you're bringing someone on, sometimes there's not a predefined process. And I know I say process and senior devs get the hives, okay? But process is helpful for junior devs because for junior devs, the world is completely unknown. You're, you're coming in, you, you, you don't know about the industry, you don't know about the domain, and so many things are unknown that process gives them a crutch on how to get from not knowing anything to knowing something. So you need to have a lesson for them on onboarding. Uh, Avoid acronyms and use common language because when you use a lot of acronyms, especially domain-specific acronyms or industry-specific acronyms, it's like you're speaking Vietnamese or French or something else. They're not going to understand you. <laughs> and you want to teach from the known to the unknown. Everyone, um, when you learn a factoid, if you have nothing to connect it to, it'll just fall off to the wayside. So what happens is, as you grow and you learn to read and you read this book or you learn this vocabulary, everything chains together. But for some reason, when you're not an educator and you're not trying to piece someone's education chain together, you think your lesson starts over here. And you never stop to consider that that person that you're trying to teach, their understanding stops back here. And so although you cannot necessarily provide a personalized education experience for everyone, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to figure out where their understanding ends so that you can figure out where your teaching needs to begin. And if you don't do that, they will always get lost. Setting expectations. I'm big on setting expectations. Because when I come in, I don't want to just meet them. I want to exceed them. And I can't do that unless I know what they are. When you have high performers and they want to do a good job, they get frustrated when they don't know what they're supposed to do. So 
If you have tools that you want them to learn, tell them. If you have theory or best practices, books you want them to read, tell them. Because if you can't articulate your expectations, you're setting them up for frustration and failure. It's just a bad, bad juju. Also, you want to set up a feedback loop, some way to tell them when they're meeting their, uh, your expectations, and some way for them, to tell them, for them to tell you if you're somehow not meeting theirs. Thank you. I like you. You go. You yeah. go. Okay, so we want to, and the other thing is you want to use process like training wheels. So many times when you start, you know some, that you have to start a project, and you know eventually you're going to move that card to done, or you're going to finish that thing, you're going to deploy it. But the pieces in between are really like magic, especially when people are moving very quickly through it. So um, what you want to do is try to provide some kind of process for them, and, and try not to get hives when I say process, but you want to have some process so that they can take all the unknowns, all the things they don't know, and at least cling to something they do know. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. I have to set up testing. I, they expect this type of test. They expect this type of test. I'm done. And then if they mess up or if they need feedback, at least they've had a pattern to follow, and they're not completely lost. Because the goal is to get a new de dev to stick around long enough to realize that we're all imposters. Uh, that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned over the last few years as I've been doing this, is that although people know lots of things, they don't know everything. And if you're a good dev, you're going to keep pushing yourself in those areas that you're an imposter because you want to get better at all the things. It's just that to new devs, everything is, is overwhelmingly unknown. And so if you can cut out the unknowns, it makes their life easier. Also, um, don't engage in the Vim EMAC debate with a newbie. It's not helpful. I am Mickey Rezenis. You can there's my Twitter handle. I work at Spreedly. It's great and we're hiring. All right. Sorry 30 seconds gone. <laughs> All right, so now I have to do this in four and a half minutes and I'm wasting more time. But I wanted to share with you um, two things. I want to talk about SOA and how you can do it better with PubSub. I totally discovered this by accident. Um, so if you have SOA, or if you're thinking about it and haven't done it yet, um, you've probably seen something like this before, or you will very soon. So let's say you have four apps. You have a company website. You have um, your internal admin tool. Um, you have an inventory management tool that your customers log into and manage their inventory. And then you have a customer storefront for your customers where they actually sell their stuff. Um, so a customer comes by, they sign up, and you proceed to make a series of API calls to these different services that need to do something when your customer signs up, like set up the account, import their inventory from their previous provider, set up DNS for their website, all kinds of things. Um, so, you know, that's great. You've got logic separated out, but um, there's some things that happen, like your, now your marketing app has to know about each one of your applications. So you get tight coupling, you get apps that know too much about each other, have too much responsibility, there's compounding failure scenarios. If the import fails, then you'll never even try to set up the DNS, and how do you recover from that? And um, the customer has to sit and wait for all this stuff to complete. So um, I thought, wouldn't it be great if, come on now, um, we had a way to divide these up, where um, customer comes and signs off, we fire off an event that says, hey, this customer signed off, signed up, and then all these other applications um, would get that event, and they know what to do. Um, the company website doesn't have to know how to tell them what to do anymore. Um, so this is PubSub. I found that out by accident and have since learned a ton about it. Um, how is this better? You no longer have tight coupling. You have oper applications that operate independently. Um, you're not putting a whole bunch of application on one app to know how to drive the others. Each application has its own responsibility. Um, trying to keep the uh, port plugged in here. Um, you no longer have this ca compounding failure scenario. You have independent failures. Um, the receivers know how to resolve those errors, or you just have one to debug to resolve it. and. Um, the operations happen asynchronously, and so your customer can go out of, go on with their um, life and not have to wait on your system. So great, give me PubSub. Um, so I'm going to introduce a gem I built called Chosky. Um, and the motivation for this was years ago, I was sitting around 
Um, I didn't have any vacation time, so I was like the only one in the office over Christmas break. And how we were doing this at the time was um, we would have one app and it would need to enqueue job, background jobs at the time we were using Rescue on to, come on, um, other applications queues, um, which was kind of great, but it was like we still have an application that knows about the other applications queues and which jobs to queue. Um, and the most, like, wouldn't it be great if we automatically um, did that for you and the applications didn't need to know about each other? Um, so this is a very simple way to add PubSub if you're already using Rescue or Sidekick, um, which a lot of people here I bet are. It's very Ruby is friendly, um, written in Ruby, and I've actually seen it, used it, working on getting it in place at the third company I've worked for who's had this problem, and the original installation is like five years and running without really any changes, and so this is an open source rewrite that um, I'm announcing today. Um, so it's very simple to use. You just gem install it and then you run Chosky and it'll run a broker for you um, and it'll use your local host Redis unless you tell it to do otherwise. Um, to write a subscriber, it's pretty simple. You require Chosky and you call the subscribe method and then you tell it what queue you want to process jobs on and then you tell it which events you want to receive and you give it a block of what to do with the events. Um, and you can have multiple subscribers. They can be in different apps, um, and they should all have their own queue. And so you basically get, my original thought is I want it multiplexing of my rescue jobs, um, now sidekick jobs, and so that's how I did it. And so you can run it with sidekick or with rescue, and I'm over time, so. But you should, Go check it out on GitHub and let me know what you think. And contributions are more than welcome. Okay, so two tiny developer tools, or rather, two tiny user interfaces I wrote for developer tools other people wrote. Actually, I think all those people are here uh, at, at this conference, so that's kind of cool. Uh, anyway, so hi, I'm Nat. Uh, I work at Patients Like Me. We are a social network for people with chronic medical conditions, and we just started using Code Climate, which I'm sure many of you know and love. We love it, uh, and our Code Climate score, I'm gonna show it to you. Despite our embarrassment, it is 1.62. <laughs> um, and we'd love to improve it, and so we look, at it, we look at Code Climate, and we're like, okay, we have clearly a God object here. It has very high overall complexity. It's called user. This is kind of a classic example. It's 2,118 complexity score. Uh, which is kind of amazing to me, but anyway. So what's, what's wrong with this thing? Well, here's an example. We have a complex method, avatar URL. It has a complexity score of 47. What does 47 mean? Well, if you look at the code climate documentation, you find out that it's using flog, which is written by Ryan Davis. And uh, if you run flog on the command line against this class, you'll see why uh, it's getting this score, 13 of those points are coming from branches, 4.5 4, 4 are coming from assignments, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of look at the method and see what you'd have to refactor about it to improve the complexity score. Um, and we start to get into a feedback loop where you're, you're improving your method and then you're testing to see if it works and then you run flog again and you grip through it to find your method and then you improve it again, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like a tighter feedback loop than that. So I use TextMate 2 another confession, and uh, I, so I wrote a plugin called flog.tm bundle, and here's what it does. Uh, I'm actually running it against flog here because I can't put company code up on the screen, but here's a complex method in flog. Uh, it has a little pointer finger next to it on the left side bar. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, hopefully on the first line of the method, you have a little pointer finger. If you click on it, it shows you the complexity it. of that method, and if you edit it and save the method, uh, it updates the complexity score and hopefully removes the pointer finger. Um, and my coworker said, well, that's great. Uh, I am the only TextMate 2 user in this entire company. Uh, most of the other ones use either Sublime Text or Vim. Uh, so I wrote Sublime Flog Highlighter, uh, which does exactly the same thing, but in Sublime Text, I can't put a pointer finger on it because of the Sublime API, but it will highlight the first line of the method with a box of varying color depending on how bad it is. Um, all right, so developer tool number two, rblineprof. This is great, I love rblineprof. It helps me find all my slow code. Um, 
And uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, you, you just uh, run it on some piece of code. It shows you, it times how long each line takes to run and all the files that it ran. And then you can get this, uh, you, you get this fairly complex object. And this is a, more or less from the readme. Uh, this is how you end up having to use it. Uh, you, you get this object and then you have to do this thing to kind of make it, uh, you, you kind of have to do this thing to make it actually show you in a nice format. So, uh, and, th and there is a way around this that's mentioned in the readme, it's peak RB line prof, uh, which is great for Rails apps that, uh, where you're trying to pr profile slow web request, you can just get it right up there on the screen, it looks very nice. Uh, but suppose you're not trying to profile a web request or you're not writing a Rails app. Uh, suppose you're writing a background job, which is what I was doing. Um, so I have this thing called rblineprof browser. Uh, what this does is you, you run it like this, and then uh, instead of having to uh, parse through your own code with file.read lines, uh, you get a menu of all the implicated files. You choose the one you want to look at, and you get this output. Uh, it's code highlighted using pigments, and uh, it pretty much, it, it mirrors roughly what the example would give you. I, I changed it a little bit because I didn't like some things about it, but it, it's roughly the same thing. And you get code highlighting and you get a menu. So I think it's a lot easier to use. Uh, thanks for listening. The, if you want to use any of these things yourself, this is how you get them, github.com slash nbudin. Thanks. Okay, this next one I know for sure, Ruby. Uh, actually, uh, I did a little switch with Ryan Stout. We have similar topics. Mine's more of an intro, so we decided to switch spots. Um, so I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we had some minor technical difficulties there, but I think we're off. Hi, everybody. I'm Rick Carlino. Uh, during the day, I'm a full-time maintainer for something called FarmBot, which is an open source robotics platform. And I'm also a maintainer for the Volt framework, which I was uh, surprised to see uh, when I was here at RubyConf that some people in the Ruby community haven't heard about it yet. So I want to give you a quick rundown of what Volt is and why it's cool. Um, basically, Volt is a... Uh, Volt is a full stack rapid prototyping framework uh, similar to Rails, but uh, unlike Rails, it's taken a stance more towards like pub sub, real time, um, single page applications. And it's got a lot of features that I think Rubyists can really appreciate. First one that I think people are gonna appreciate when they give Volt a try is that you run Ruby in the front end. There's no JavaScript unless you explicitly want to run JavaScript. Um, and it accomplishes this using something called the Opal compiler. And Opal allows you to transpile your Ruby code into JavaScript that can run natively on the client's browser. Right here I've got an example where I have a uh, controller, which in Volt controllers run on the browser, not on the server. And I'm calling the JavaScript alert message. And as you can see, it's totes a maze. Um, it also has source maps, a big thing that a lot of people hear when they get started with something like Opal is they think it's gonna be a you know, total pain to get started with. And I would say that the level of complexity you're gonna deal with is on par with CoffeeScript. So if you're already using CoffeeScript, then you can pretty much uh, handle developing with Ruby on the front end. So the, the big win with Volt that for me is that you can do data sync without having to write REST APIs or a lot of boilerplate for syncing things on the browser because the browser's not an afterthought in Volt. So when you define a data model that works on the back end, all of that code gets sent to the front end. So now you've got validations and things like that. And um, you also, when uh, this GIF is a little bit fuzzy here, but um, you can see I've got two browser windows open and I'm creating a new model, and it makes a call to the server, and when the new model is created, everybody who has that record loaded in their browser is gonna be able to see that update happen in real time, and you don't write any of this sync code yourself. It's part of the framework, so it saves you a bunch of time when you're, uh, when you're just trying to prototype something and ship it fast. And just because you don't write REST APIs doesn't mean you can't write it. You can do uh, REST APIs, uh, it's very familiar. This is what you would put into your route file. It looks uh, kind of Railsy or maybe even Sinatra-ish in some ways. And then this would be your controller code right there. And this is running in the back end, obviously, because we're just doing traditional HTTP. You can do files, JSON. Um, it's, it's pretty complete in that regard. Some people try to say, oh, is this um, you know, Meteor for Ruby? 
Not quite. It does a lot of the things that you can do with traditional web frameworks, and it, it really is a general purpose full stack framework. So if you like REST, keep doing it. Um, going further into that uh, about how you have one model, it's very dry. Um, you got many storage layers, like you see here. Um, right now we support MongoDB, and as of this week, we have support for PostgreSQL. Um, <laughs> Always a good thing. And uh, the good thing is, though, that when you write that class definition for your model, you can just take that thing and put it into HTML5 local storage, pop it out of there, throw it into PostgreSQL, and you're only writing your, uh, your validation rules once in one place. So you save a bunch of time. Uh, here's an example right here. I got a widget class with a string field called name. Uh, I make a variable called my widget, and then boom, I throw it into the database. Uh, store is what's called a repository. Uh, in this case, it's going to be MongoDB. Um, but I just throw that into MongoDB. It goes back to the server, saves it there. Later, I change my mind. Now I want to store that model in local storage. And it's the exact same API. The only thing I've changed is that instead of calling store, which is MongoDB, I'm now calling local storage. Very dry. Uh, just like Rails, it's batteries included. You know, it knows what it means to be building a, a full stack framework. And so right off the bat, you got user authentication. You don't need to worry about making that decision on your own. Uh, this is a Volt app that I made probably an hour ago. Um, I just did the Volt new command. And as you see, I've got a login page. I've got, you know, sign up, forgot password. That's things you don't need to worry about. And um, if you need to change the view, very easy to do also. This is the model that comes with uh, Volt by default. It's open for extension. You know, if you, um, you know, want to change the way that the user class is validated, you're free to do so. Uh, but Volt users get some kind of special treatment, and I'll show you what that means here in a sec. It means we have a permissions and authorizations. Oh, am I done? You're done. Oh, okay, well, uh, check it out. Um, I got my blog there. Uh, say hi to us on Gitter Chat. We're a friendly bunch. Uh, thanks. Thanks, whoever you are. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, I'm uh, Ratnadeep. Uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is Ruby Vernac, writing code not in English. So that's my Twitter handle, RTDP. I work for a company called Big Binary. So company does not have offices. Everyone works remotely from home. And I decided that, OK, uh, let's not have home as well. So yeah, this is what I do. Since January of this month, I'm traveling to all the places and working from there. Uh, I have been to like 18 cities, seven Ruby conferences. This is like seventh Ruby conference for me this year alone. And uh, uh, yeah, this is one of the Ruby adventure that I did recently. I was at the Khardungla top, which is a peak in Himalaya where you can uh, drive, which is like highest motorable road in the world. And I went to 18,000 feet and sat in the place there and did some three commits on the client code and pushed when I came down. So. <laughs> So if you are thinking that you did code in the 35,000 feet when you are in plane, that is mocking, OK? <laughs> so, and I recently heard that uh, there is a 3G signal a little bit weak, uh, albeit on the uh, Everest as well. So maybe someday. So yeah, uh, so the topic is Ruby Vernac, what and why. So uh, the, this project that I'm working on is about writing Ruby in various spoken languages and not just in English. And the reason I thought of this idea uh, was uh, I was teaching my younger brother about Ruby programming and uh, he had many of the questions uh, related to, okay, what is def? What is class? Why are we using class? Why are we using def? Def, def is a definition. Definition of what? Definition of function. Okay. So I, I found that it is very difficult for him to understand uh, many English keywords because English is not the first language or a native language for him. Uh, in India, they start teaching it at the age of 12 in the schools. So yeah, you can understand that. So that was the reason I first time thought of uh, writing uh, something which will allow people to write Ruby in their native languages. And that's what I uh, tried to do. So here is an simple example which is uh, hello word uh, it's written in hindi uh, it's just uh, puts hello chapo namaskar namaste whatever uh, it takes like one line of ruby to get this working you just have to alias print to the chapo and that's it because ruby supports utf8 there is no issues and now uh, yeah, this is a full-fledged example which uh, we can do like this is an entire program with um, <laughs> thanks 
this is entire program end to end written in uh, uh, Hindi. Uh, the, the keywords are replaced, which are like class and the functions like def end is also replaced. You can see there is an array which has like uh, strings and stuff and then uh, there are methods being called an array. Array comes from the uh, standard library. So with this project, you can add the translations for the standard library. You can add translations for the keywords. And the rest of the things are anyway can be written in any language because uh, Ruby supports UTF-8. Uh, yeah, and uh, I hope like nobody here understands what's written in that program, right? Now imagine 94% of the people in this world are not native English speakers. You are feeling their feelings right now. So yeah, that was one of the example. Uh, so why to do that? So I, I uh, made this uh, project and I presented uh, it at the two of the conferences in India and uh, I got very positive response from the people. Uh, what things that I found with this is uh, learning becomes understanding because foobar, hello world, this doesn't make sense for the people who are not native speakers, okay? Uh, f uh, another example, class. Now, if you uh, think of the class, class has a three different meanings based on the context, like is it a verb, is it a noun, is it an um, adjective, or, and whatnot. So for the non-native speakers, when they heard here class, the most commonly used reference is a classroom kind of a thing, which is not expected here. Second is module. I tried to translate module into Hindi, and the translation comes up as a, a separate part of um, a satellite. Now that is not what we mean we, when we create the modules in programming language, right? So I, I uh, thought, oh, so what you have to do is extract the meaning out of the English, think about what that meaning can be represented best in your own language and come up with the words. And I can guarantee that whatever uh, uh, keywords that we are using in Hindi, no one will come up with the questions like, should I use a class or a module for this thing? Because it makes sense, it makes, uh, uh, really uh, meaningful to have those keywords and learn uh, related to that. Uh, one other thing is learning becomes fun, as in uh, uh, when I created many of the examples for the Hindi and Marathi, I made sure that I use all the references, uh, 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 fun things, slangs from the local languages, and that makes it uh, understandable to the people. Just foobar, okay, I did foobar. Okay, hello word, hello word, what, what's that, right? So the, the emotion that is present in that native languages can be brought into those examples and because of that, learning becomes fun. So yeah, uh, it can be checked at uh, this GitHub URL. If you are interested in converting it to any other languages, you are welcome. You can contact me on RTDP, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, it's good for education, that's what I'm looking at. And secondly, it's good for the people who don't have English as their native language, and then they can perform these exercises to rethink about the programming concepts that they have learned. They can try an exercise of converting programs into their own languages. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> me neither. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions to the audience if you could just shout out your answers. Uh, are you guys pretty good at est estimating or pretty bad at estimating? <laughs> All right. Do you usually estimate too high or too low when you're wrong? <laughs> All right. Why do we estimate? You're told to. Uh, we want to we know the cost, how much will things cost. So why, why do we want to know the cost? So we want to know whether it's going to be worth the cost. Um, so we want to figure out the ROI, the return on investment. So that's the formula is here, uh, the value and the cost. Um, uh, what do we want the ROI to be? Positive. Positive. All right, how do we know whether we should start on a project? <laughs> Has to have a positive ROI. Uh, can we calculate the ROI without knowing the expected value? No. So do project managers typically figure out the value before asking us to estimate our, our cost and our time? <laughs> so why are we wasting our time, right? Uh, so we're worse at calculating ROIs than we are at estimating. Uh, there's no point, if, if we've already started on a project, there's no point in calculating that ROI. We're already doing it. So uh, the other conclusion is don't estimate at the story level. You're, it's too late at that point. Um, so no estimates um, is, is uh, something, it, when I say no estimates, I don't mean don't estimate anything. I say don't estimate at a fine grain level, it's too late at that point. Only estimate at the project level or an epic level. 
Uh, and another way we can do that is we can actually shorten the feedback loop. We can, we can iterate and we can set a two week iteration and we can determine the ROI after the fact instead of trying to, to estimate it ahead of time. Um, and we should count stories instead of story points. Uh, you, it turns out that the predictive value is pretty much about the same or even possibly better by just counting the stories instead of wasting time spending uh, estimating points. So that's all I got. Uh, hit me up on Twitter if you uh, disagree or agree. Thanks. I saw something. It flickered. All right. We can kind of see that. Is it good? All right. So I'm going to talk about book duets. This was my student project over at Ada Developers Academy. I've been programming for seven months now. I am an opportunity scholar here at RubyConf. This is my first RubyConf, so that's cool. I go by she and they pronouns, and here we go. Uh, we're going to look at Markov mashups of lyrics and literary quotes. So if you go to bookduets.com, um, you'll see that um, you can get mashups of a um, artist and a musician and a author. So here's something awesome by Aqua and Anne Rice. Um, you'll see that it says, I'm the vampire Lestat. Sure can jump in. I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. So that's what it does. If you sign up for an account, you can save your favorite ones and tweet them out. So I had to, for the purposes of my project, talk about like, you know, what the purpose of this is and the user personas. Um, I made it for fun. Um, I come from a freelance writing background and I wanted to make something that would amuse me. And I wanted to make it for book nerds, language nerds, and music nerds. And I have a feeling that some of you are in the audience. All right, so what is a Markov chain? I learned about Markov chains through an amazing developer's talk in Seattle. Her name is Liz Usselton, and she also graduated from my school. And she was talking about Twitter bots that use Markov chains to make some really interesting um, computer-generated um, texts. So what it does is it takes a look at the current word and uses probability distribution to find the next possible word in this mashup. Uh, so you can see here that um, I've used an amazing gem called Marky Markov to, um, yeah, um, I love saying it, uh, to create this dictionary. And if you take a look at in a, it's followed by these possible words below it. So uh, here's my tech stack. Um, I effectively made two apps. I made an API and a front-facing web app. Uh, and I was trying to practice like a mini version of SOA. Uh, so one of the coolest things was using Redis to kind of cache um, what people are um, looking up as far as musicians and um, authors. So as people use this, it gets faster and faster and learns um, by building up lyrics and excerpts from books. Uh, so there's kind of like a explanation as to why I decided to use Redis. Uh, because of copyright restrictions, a lot of Lyric um, APIs don't allow you to just grab huge chunks to feed like a, a lyrical corpus. So um, here's like an example of what Redis is caching. It's some lyrics from Alstra. Um, and if you want to take a look at you know, making mashups of your own, I created a secure public API. Um, and I'm totally open to like feedback or suggestions or ideas on how to make this cooler. Um, and I was just going to walk you through like what it looks like to create a, create this mashup. So you send it an author and a musician name. It collects um, texts and builds something called a corpora. Um, it feeds that into Marky Markov, and then it creates a mashup. And I find that if a um, artist and musician, author and a musician have similar words and vocabularies, then you get really fun mashups where it jumps back and forth every other word. Um, but if they're very like dissimilar, then you get kind of chunky mashups. So it's pretty cool. Um, I wanted to say mahalo to uh, my instructors, Carrie and Jeremy, uh, for teaching me Ruby and getting me started with Rails. 
Um, my classmates were known as the Unigoats, and one of them is here right now. And I also want to say thank you to the Ruby community. Hi, I'm Brittany Alexander, and I'm gonna tell you guys how to get a damn job. This is mostly for junior developers who are looking for your first gig. Um, but I think some of these things could be applicable to people who are trying to move up maybe from junior to mid-level or from mid-level to senior. Um, oh no, it died. Oh, okay, here we go. Okay, so anyway, so the first thing that you should know about me is that I'm awesome. And the second thing that you should know about me is that I'm incredibly humble. Um, you should also know that I met Taylor Hansen last month. It's a point of pride. I've been waiting 20 years to do that. Um, the week after I met Taylor Hansen, I started my very first junior developer job at Mannheim. Um, we are hiring, so um, you can contact me at Twitney the Girl if you want me to introduce you to my hiring manager. Um, the first thing that I want to tell all of you if you're looking for any kind of job is to stop self-sabotaging. A lot of you aren't even applying to jobs because you're waiting for for the perfect moment whenever you're ready and you know all of the things, you're never going to feel ready, ever. And it's okay, because if you feel like you're in a position where you know everything and that you're ready, then you're probably not growing and you're probably super bored and nobody wants to be bored. So whenever you start looking for jobs, you should make it about you. You should figure out what you want to do because um, you're going to be working at this place for probably one to five years and you don't want it to suck. So make a list of all the things that you want and all of the things that you don't want, but also be a little bit flexible. You want to create your brand. I see a lot of this aspiring web developer or like student learning some Ruby, but um, that's not what you are. You are a software engineer. You are a web developer. You are a self-taught web developer. Um, and also, whenever someone asks you something and you're like, oh, I don't know anything about RSpec, what you should say is, oh, RSpec, how hard could that be? Let me just Google that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I said, how hard could that be, like five times in my interview at Mannheim. And they actually told me that that was like the best attitude about that. So <laughs> if it works for me, it could probably work for you. So after you've decided who you are and you're putting it out there, um, you need to put it out there everywhere. Cast the widest net possible. You want to talk on LinkedIn, you want to be on Meetup, um, you want to be in your local technology Slack. If there's not a local technology Slack in your community, you should make one, and then you'll be the person who made the local technology Slack, and everybody will want to hire you and be your friend. Um, use Twitter a lot, um, Facebook, meet people in real life, and actually communicate face-to-face. -face. I know this is really strange for some of us, but you can do it. Um, and then also, if there is a company that you are like dead set that you want to work at, just email them and say, hey, you're not posting junior developer positions, but you should hire me anyway. And they probably will have someone who wants to talk to you. Um, one thing that I do want to say about Meetup is that I did get my job off of Meetup. I did not apply for my job. I posted in every Meetup group of something that I was interested in. I went to all of those Meetups. And the little part where you're supposed to introduce yourself, instead of introducing myself, I just said that I was looking for jobs. My hiring manager kept seeing my face pop up, and I guess he was like, well, this girl keeps showing up, and it says she's looking for a job, so I'll talk to her. Um, then, once you get offered interviews, just take all of them. Like, I know that I told you to be discerning, and yeah, you don't want to just work for any old company, but every time you do a technical interview, you're going to be more comfortable with the process. You're going to learn something everywhere you go. Don't, don't stress out. Have a lot of fun. Wear your superhero underpants to make yourself feel better and uh, <laughs> make friends. And if you see something at a company that makes you uncomfortable, maybe you thought you really wanted to work at name cool startup in your city, um, and you go in there and someone asks you a really inappropriate question, now you know that you don't want to work there. And you can tell people, no, 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 they're sketchy. <laughs> if they don't pick you, it's fine. You probably learned something. and. The next time, you'll be a total badass, and it'll be awesome. This is my friend Shayna's website. She's here. She's one of the Opportunity Scholars, and she's looking for a job. <laughs> if you feel slighted that I did not promote you, who are also looking for a job, tweet at me with this hashtag. 
and I will retweet you, and then I encourage everybody else in here to follow that hashtag, and if you can't hire them, you should retweet them so that everyone else can see that you know lots of cool people looking for jobs. Thanks. Woo!